Hi, welcome to Project Geospatial. I'm your host, Adam Simmons, and this is Industry Limelight, where we highlight a company who has a unique technology to share. On this segment, we have the pleasure of getting to know NextBillion.ai, who provides AI-enabled hyper-local offerings for logistics, delivery, e-commerce, and ride-sharing businesses. With us to discuss NextBillion.ai is co-founder Gaurav Bubna. Uh, Gaurav, thank you for joining us, and can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we dive into learning about NextBillion.ai? Thank you so much, Adam, for, for having me here. Excited to be sharing more about us uh, as a company and, and what you're doing in location. Uh, yes, I mean, my background is basically, uh, you know, my education, I studied computer science, was always very interested in, you know, everything, mathematics, deep technology, et cetera. So I started my career uh, essentially working on AI well before it was called, like AI was a buzzword. So I started actually on Wall Street uh, working on a bunch of math and applied math statistics type of problems. Didn't find that too exciting. Didn't feel like I was, you know, interacting closely enough with real customers or real problems, so to say. So I did a startup uh, that was in recruitment, but essentially, you know, have been working on AI and, uh, you know, building real products using AI machine learning pretty much all my life. Uh, my stint with uh, you know, this experience or, or what led to uh, this uh, starting of this company was, again, uh, in the last five years, I've been working in ride sharing and deliveries, et cetera. And one of the things we noticed there was, uh, so I, I led a bunch of product teams there focused on, you know, what, what's called marketplace or fulfillment problems. Essentially, how do we ensure packages or rides or goods uh, get in a very predictable fashion, you know, where they should be going, how do we ensure they get them fast? How do we ensure those things are priced effectively? And essentially, we saw that maps and location played a huge role in all these industries. Uh, and that was my background for the past five years before starting this company. And essentially, what in a way led to, and, and you know, I'm sure we'll touch more upon that, uh, but what led to us starting this company. Excellent. Uh, so nextbillion.ai, can you get into it a little bit and describe the business model that you started with? You obviously described the brief history and what you got you into it, from some of the, uh, uh, the supply and delivery and, and supply chain, et cetera. But, but talk a little bit more about the problems the industry had and the, 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 the different applications, the mapping applications that existed, especially in, in your area of the world, right? You're out of uh, you're based out of Singapore, is that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, so I mean, I think maybe it's it's useful to, you know, share a little more context. Uh, so uh, I was working for this company called Grab, which is like this, you know, large super app, as they call it, uh, based out of Southeast Asia, uh, with, you know, headquartered in Singapore. Uh, and essentially, it operates a ride hailing business, a food delivery business, a logistics business. So think of it like, Postmates and DoorDash and Uber sort of all mixed into one. Uh, and uh, what we saw there was we were very heavily reliant on Google Maps, uh, where pretty much like there was a phrase we used to use internally called no map, no app. Uh, so because, it, it, you know, we relied so heavily on Google Maps uh, and Google sort of kept increasing its prices over the years. In, you know, in 2018, there was this infamous 10x price increase that it did. Uh, and so, so, you know, cost was one element of it. All these businesses tend to be relatively low margin. Uh, so maps costs are pretty substantial. So that was one element. Uh, and Google, for some reason, has just kept increasing prices over the years. Uh, and we anticipate, it, you know, that to continue to be the trend going forward as well. Uh, so, so that was one. The other part of this was there were just things we needed to do, which any existing mapping provider could not do. Uh, a simple example of this was uh, latency and scalability and throughput. Like if you're, if you're doing a whole bunch of orders or rides or logistics planning, delivery planning, you need to be able to call these APIs at very, very large volumes. I believe in my previous job, we were doing 5 billion API calls a day. Um, now, at that kind of scale, firstly, you know, it's extremely expensive. But more importantly, if I wanted to use Google, 
you can't use it because if you're trying to make 100,000 API calls per second, Google caps out at 1,000 as an example. Um, is that so just a price thing or is that a technology thing? It's just a technology thing. Like Because anything uh, hosted across the network, which is not inside your own cloud environment, it just cannot support that kind of scale. Like, you know, anecdotally, we've heard from Uber that their internal mapping service caps out or the maximum load it supports is up to a million API calls per second. Now, you know, that's just like 1,000x of what Google claims it provides as the maximum limit uh, of, you know, to its custom customers. So scalability is another. Then there are other elements, right, which is, you know, what we call in our business that one map does not fit all which is to say, however great a Google or a Mapbox or any of these other companies here, TomTom, Tom, any of them might be, the reality is they have one view of the world. So take a simple example. Let's say if you're in New York City, uh, you, you, know, just, you were shopping at Macy's. Now, Macy's is this one full giant block in New York City. Now, if you called an Uber and you use Google Maps, Google Maps would say, hey, Macy's, right? Like there is one Macy's. But reality is, if you're trying to get picked up in an Uber, you need to specify which avenue, which street, is it the start of that avenue? Is it like, where am I exactly standing? Now, this is not a problem that Google is not good enough. It has Macy's pointed correctly. But for Uber, what matters is, hey, which is the entrance gate? Which is the exit gate? If I'm, I'm an employee working inside Macy's, Maybe I need my food delivery person to come to a different door. And if it's a loading dock, right, like it's goods coming in the morning, maybe there's a loading gate or a loading dock where I need trucks to come to. Now, this, you know, this is an example of things. And again, like now, for example, food delivery or just deliveries in general globally, which is a very hot thing right now, it happens on all kinds of modes of transportation. There are cars doing deliveries. There are e-scooters doing deliveries, bicycles. In other parts of the world, there are minivans. There are motorbikes. Uh, Southeast Asia has these things called tuk-tuks. Uh, you know, I'm sure anyone who's traveled to Southeast Asia is aware of them. Uh, so, you know, there are all these things. And across the world, you would find each of them have very different local regulations, like maybe a truck cannot enter sort of the central area of the city after 6 p.m. as it, or, or maybe, you know, in peak rush hours, trucks are not allowed. Or, you know, there could be a whole bunch of these. E-scooters don't behave the same as pedestrians. So um, you, you, just to interject there for a second, so you've highlighted two major problems, right? Uh, Google can't, mm -hmm. companies like Google can't handle the amount of API calls that you want to be able to, or your right. customers want to be able to handle, uh, the, the amount of data essentially that you want to pull. Um, and to and, and then you also have uh, handling local regulations by either or local uh, restrictions or uh, directing people at a local level towards uh, either pickup or delivery at specific locations along exactly. the streets. And those two those two items. Let's start with the first one. The API calls. What kind of API calls? What kind of you, you mentioned? Google's not even enough for you, but so so at first to create next billion AI. So how many uh, API calls do you push through next billion AI as a unique differentiator compared to other companies? Um, and that that's an incredible thing to handle if you're if you're pushing more than them. So for for our customers, for example, we already have a bunch around the world where you know across all. Customers, we're still fairly young as a company, but we are trending towards serving about 100 million API calls per day. But what's more interesting is customers who use us, because they're so constrained by using like Google as an example on the number of API calls they make, most of our customers, when they switch over to us in a space of three to six months itself, for the same level of business, because they're no longer constrained, they find themselves using at least 10x the number of API calls they were using before. And this is also where we innovate on the pricing model and the deployment model where, as an example, uh, we are able to provide multi-cloud and on-prem deployments. So to say, hey, you know what? You want everything running inside your own environment? Go ahead, be my guest, right? We'll support you. We'll deploy our whole stack in your cloud as an example. So we're able to support like our latencies tend to be 
anywhere between 2x to 7x lower than what, say, a Google or a Mapbox can provide. Our throughput, the maximum number of API calls we can support, we've already done 20x more than what any of these services provide to their customers as the stated limit. Um, so, you know, these are things we're able to support uh, fairly effectively. Uh, and, yeah. and that, you know, this is a great example of yeah. why we started this company. And, and to go on to that second piece about how do you handle, you've highlighted some of the local problems. So how do you handle right. going location by location and, and handling a lot of the local restrictions or the needs of uh, individual supply chains to uh, get around uh, their, their regional cities and, and neighborhoods? Yeah, great question, Adam. So I think the what our approach is, uh, and this is where we differ in a very fundamental way to all the other companies, where we call this, we believe the future of location-based services is going to be decentralized. So essentially, if you look at a Google or a Mapbox or any of these, they say, hey, I have the best data. I have the best APIs. You go use my stuff. We say no matter how good they are, they cannot handle all these local nuances and you know, things that are specific or unique to your business. We provide our customers tools to say, you know what, you go specify this for yourself. So you want to specify that, hey, my trucks cannot enter the city after 6 p.m., go ahead and specify these. You want to say, hey, but my motorbikes can, for example, enter the city or these lanes, or maybe in other parts of the world, there are odd even rules, like depending on the number plate of your car, you can or cannot do certain things. So we tell our customers, hey, let's take an ex let's take the same Uber example. If you're Uber and you're my customer, I would say, hey, you know what, Uber, here are our tools. I don't want you to use next billion maps. I want you to sort of enable Uber maps. You go ahead, you specify the restrictions, and your APIs will incorporate your local nuances or specifications or configuration you want. Anything you do is proprietary to you. So we want to enable, say, Uber Maps as opposed to saying, hey, we understand the world the best because we think we absolutely cannot understand the world in all these nuances. Uh, so we want to enable our customers to do whatever they want. So so you point them towards what you, you think is best for their local region instead of pointing them exactly. towards either yourself or having some agnostic Google Maps or, or you know, uh, Mapbox for everything. Exactly. So, so that that's exactly our vision. Where effectively, you know, another way we tell companies is we're trying to deconstruct what all these mapping companies, you know, use internally, and provide those internal tools or components in a very easy to use manner. So to say, you know what, Google internally obviously specifies road closures, but instead of everyone seeing the same version of road closures you want to specify your own road closures or where you do not want your drivers to go, go ahead and specify that. That's it. You know, you specify this. You don't have to worry that, hey, Google or here maps will take a month because it needs to verify. It needs to do all these things, make sure it applies to everyone. You want to go specify, specify it right now. And it's live in the next 10 seconds. That's incredible. That's uh, so that's that's a quick deployment, actually, which brings us a great segue into the tech stack, because you've talked a little bit about that, uh, actually a lot about that. Um, so if you're not running on Google Maps, you're not running off of Mapbox, you're not running on this. How do you handle what what have you built your uh, to be able to handle all the API calls? What, what have you built it on top of? Where do you host it? How, what's the technology behind it? Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and I think it's it's a great question. So I think one of the things that's changed in the technology landscape are two things, we think. The first is in, in the mapping world is this rise of open source tech and open source data, right? Like, which is, it's the same trend that's happened in a bunch of other industries. It's just surprising it, it, it didn't happen so much in location-based services. So one is OpenStreetMaps and the entire ecosystem around OpenStreetMaps. So, you know, we believe we are, you know, maybe after Mapbox, possibly the first company that's taking all of that and making it sort of enterprise grade. So think of it as, you know, we offer, you know, that's a development that we leverage heavily for our customers to, to build sort of these configurable applications. That's one. Another bit that we rely very heavily on is, you know, in the recent years, containerization and Kubernetes, et cetera. 
uh, that has sort of you know uh, risen quite a bit. So one of the advantages we have as a very new company is we you know we are Kubernetes first. So everything that we've done is containerized. Everything is you know deployable anywhere. And what this allows us to do, the combination of these two things is. Uh, we are able to create very configurable applications. It's super easy for us to say, hey, you know what? Uh, you know, you're the, I don't know, you're a US government agency in the United States. You have signed up on Azure. You want to be able to overlay some data, have some APIs configured to your needs. Super easy for us. We can go ahead and deploy this in Azure such that it works in California. So everything is close to you in your environment, everything. Uh, but let's say we have a ride hailing customer who's based out of Singapore who wants some totally different set of things. It's very easy for us because we're not constrained in any way by this underlying centralized infrastructure that, hey, I can only build on top of what Google provides me. So if Google does not provide me an e-scooter option, sorry, I can't provide any solution that's tailored to e-scooters. So I would say OpenStreetMaps and, you know, Kubernetes are two sort of recent innovations we leverage very heavily on top of. Okay. And I mean, obviously, we have a mapping expertise and background. A lot of our teams, you know, worked in different location-based services type technologies, mapping companies. So, you know, that's a key piece where, you know, we build a bunch of mapping tech and combine these elements for our solutions. That's that's great. Do you have any? Uh, so, how about let's talk about your customers base, not specifics, but do you have any good customer stories that have come out of the work you've done uh, over the last year? Yeah, so I think uh, so. There are two products that you know we work with our customers on. One is uh, APIs. So, for example, directions APIs, or you know, how much time is my driver going to take from you know my home to the office, or you know, could be from New York City to uh, LA. Uh, so we work with a bunch of customers around the world on better you know, APIs, directions, distance matrix APIs. Uh, an example is we work with one of the largest food delivery companies in the United States. They had the same problems, cost of Google Maps, uh, scalability problems, et cetera. And what we were able to do is essentially you know, provide something in an on-prem deployment that actually using their data and machine learning on top of their data combined with OpenStreetMaps is actually able to produce accuracy that's much better than Google. Uh, it's also able to handle loads that are like 10x higher. It's able to have latencies that are 4x lower. Uh, so, so they're finding you know, tremendous value in this. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is they do deliveries in, for example, cars, which is a very plain vanilla use case. A different example is we are working with this freight platform in the United States, uh, where they, they, you know, their software runs on a bunch of trucking companies, and their truck. So imagine if you're a truck driver going from LA to San Francisco, um, or New York to San Francisco. Google might say, hey, you know what, that trip is going to take me two days. Uh, in a car because it's going to assume non-stop driving, cars drive at a certain speed. But hey, if I'm if I'm driving a large truck, I'm not going to be driving at the same speed. I'm going to be stopping along the way, eating along the way, sleeping along the way. So a trip that Google suggests takes two days, in reality will probably take me closer to six days as an example. Uh, so that example of another customer, you know, types of customers we support, this is on the API side. Another interesting innovation we are doing is on the map data side, which is there are a bunch of companies that try to use OpenStreetMaps directly, or they try to use you know here and TomTom's data as an example. So you know this is an example of a ride hailing company based out of Southeast Asia that wants to maintain its own private map data layers. Again, not be constrained by these refresh cycles of these mapping companies that can take a month, three months, six months not even sure how this goes. These businesses are very real time. So they take sort of map data and they, they've they built stuff or they want to be able to maintain their own layers, be able to respond to fixes immediately. They have a bunch of data they want to be able to you know take that and improve maps with. So we, for example, have built tools to help them manage map data. So we call this offering map data management as a service where we take map data, we are able to take their proprietary data and build a bunch of tools 
that can create custom sort of private data layers for them, allow them to merge any updates that come from their mapping provider, overlay their custom data, and we take this entire headache of operations, tools, et cetera, and map data out of them. And again, we deploy all this you know, inside their cloud environment. So they're super happy. They can then easily go and build their routing tech on top. So, so these are two examples. You know, one is on the API side, one is on the map data side. Uh, in both scenarios, we're pretty much able to. So we have customers today across four continents, all except South America today. And there's no reason we can't serve South America uh, across some 10 or 12 countries. Uh, so yeah, so really excited about you know how how these go. No, that's that's amazing. So you got a lot of uh, already within a year of operation, you have some uh, good use cases, some good customer stories that have come out of it, and you're already working in several locations around the world. Uh, you know, you, you've already mentioned you're out of Singapore, you work in the U.S. Uh, you've mentioned mm -hmm. India, I believe, once, and uh, according to uh, some of your material on your website, you even you have some customers out of Beijing, right? Um, so, uh, once again, you're already going well beyond where you were initially established, which is incredible. Lots, lots of growth ahead. Uh, one thing I, I definitely wanted to ask here is, uh, initially you, you worked in logistics, delivery, e-commerce in the ride sharing businesses. Uh, however, mm -hmm. is there a sector of the geospatial or mapping world that you feel like, uh, next billion would like to move into uh, because you feel like uh, aside from those areas of business, you're like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Our technology, our mapping side of things is really good. I think we can move in this sector of the industry and, and probably do pretty well as well. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's, like, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic question. Uh, and which is, it, it's a, it's a really, it's a burning topic, which we're like going through right now. One of the big realizations for us has been everything related to governments. So smart cities is, is like this big buzzword right now globally, but just governments in general invest a lot in GIS. We don't come from that world. So, you know, maybe it's obvious to a bunch of, for example, uh, people listening to this, but uh, we didn't realize this. And so everything around governments, government agencies, or people who work in that space, we're finding there to be incredible value. I'll share again, another customer story. We are working with the city government of, of a very large city in India that wants to enable uh, better emergency response services. So essentially faster response times, better utilization, et cetera. Now, you know, it's again, it's, it's sort of like a GIS mapping problem. How do we, how do we understand the layers of typical, you know, incident locations? You know, what does the spread of fire stations look like? You know, where are the ambulances in real time? What's the capacity or constraints that each ambulance can provide given an incident how quickly can we dispatch an ambulance uh, so this is an example of you know what we are working uh, similarly working with you know for example of the governments in middle east where they are trying to invest in map data uh, for a bunch of you know just national you know asset reasons defense security all of that in general we think governments is going to be a huge space for us uh, it's an area we don't still, in all honesty, don't understand really well, but that's going to be a big focus area for us for the next 12 to 24 months. Excellent. Well, thank you for answering that question. Uh, and uh, as we're wrapping up here, I want to ask, is there anything else you'd like to mention about Next Billion, some of the projects they're working on uh, that you'd like to let our audience know? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the elements we feel uh, very excited about is what we are calling, I mean, it's, it's a broad theme, which is, we think there's a huge space in spatial data management or location data management, where so far, you know, same, this idea of centralization, companies would offer some data sets, say, or you build something on top of. Five, 10 years ago, companies or just agencies, they didn't have their own data so much. So they said, hey, can you tell me data? And I want to see how I can utilize that. Today, we find that there's a lot of places just generating data. Companies have their own data. Other public sources are generating data. But what we feel today is missing is, you know, how do you combine these data sources? How do I take public data, merge it with my proprietary spatial data and make it useful? How do I combine, you know, some other, you know, 
commercial data that I just bought with government data sources. So we're really investing and are huge believers in this thing of spatial data management, where how do we take you know, proprietary or data that might be lying in data warehouses somewhere, merge it with other spatial data sources, make it useful. We think, again, governments have a lot of these, private companies have a lot of these. Uh, and we think we need a platform like ours, which is very decentralized to enable some of these. Uh, so spatial data management, we feel is going to be a big theme in the next five to 10 years. And, and we hope to be able to, you know, be a com become a company that, People think when people think of spatial data management, they think of next billion. Uh, so I think yeah, that's an element I would add, which is spatial data management. Uh, and you know, we feel again, if any of anyone listening to this feels like they have this problem, yeah, please do reach out to us. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that very much. And uh, if anybody watching this wants to get a hold of you because they're really interested, what's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, I mean just feel free to reach out to any of us on LinkedIn. But yeah, my personal email is gaurav at nb.ai, uh, nb for next billion. Yeah, you know, it should be super straightforward. Uh, yeah, because we work across so many time zones, you can pretty much expect whenever you send me an email, expect a response within, I don't know, three to four hours. And, and that uh, website so yeah. is uh, nextbillion.ai. And, uh, yes. do you, and you have a, do you have a general company contact e email as well? Yes. So hello at nextbillion.ai. That's a general uh, company contact. Please feel free to like, reach out to any of that. So you have my personal email, the company contact as well. Perfect. Well, once again, thank you very much for popping on. Tell us a lot about nextbillion.ai and introducing us to your company. It's a it's an amazing company. You've done quite a bit in the last year since you started up, and I can't wait to see what new technologies and new areas you grow into uh, in the coming years. Uh, so with that said, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Adam Simmons with Project Geospatial on the Industry Limelight. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you, everybody.